This is the All Star Charts Podcast with J.C. Peretz. Today on the podcast, we take it way back. J.C. sits down with veteran technical analyst Jeff Weiss. This was a real treat. J.C. asks Jeff to share stories from his early days on Wall Street, including the beginning of options trading, the old squawk boxes and waiting in line to use quote machines as a young kid in the 1960s. The lessons Jeff shares are still incredibly valuable today. So give it a listen and make sure to enjoy it. This was a good one. Hi, JC. What's going on, man? How are you, sir? I am doing very well. Nice to hear your voice. Um, Not too many people say that, so thank you. You bring a lot of excitement to the game, Jeff. Anybody ever told you that? Well, you know, I got involved in the business uh, 51 years ago for a sixth grade math project that my dad used to take me into the Shearson Hamill brokerage office back when the uh, quote machine was four inches square. It was called the Bunker Ramo machine, and you could only get one quote, the bid, the ask, and the volume uh, at a time. So um, okay. I'm, I still have that excitement I had as a kid. You know, it's important. I always tell kids because I do – um you know some work with schools and stuff i always tell kids you know you must like what you do so we're talking late 60s sixth grade math project and that was your introduction to the stock market huh you know it was it was and unfortunately like many people do when they get in the business i i i actually received um what i thought was a fortune uh at the time four hundred dollars which my dad gave me from my uh Bar Mitzvah, and uh, I bought Mattel toy at 80, sold it at the equivalent two splits later of 160 and proclaimed my desire to drop out of out of um, uh, high school of fire, which I mentioned in my book, my mother quickly uh, extinguished. And little uh, did I know uh, that I was ill prepared for the worst bear market since the Great Depression, which I believe is the worst one I've experienced to this day. And that was the 1973-1974 bear market. Yeah, so that came within like, you know, for me, obviously that was before my time. So as a market participant, I'm a historian. and I mean, I could draw these things for you. So the market peaked in the mid 60s and kind of went sideways until the early 80s. Within Mm -hmm. that Within that larger, you know, sort of structural, as we as we uh, technical analysts like to call it, sort of bear market, there were vicious bull markets as well, monster rallies, and then cyclical bear markets within that longer term consolidation, right? Like- Certainly a giant one, you know, 16 years, 16, 17 year base, uh, 16, you know, 17, 18 year run right to that uh, uh, March of uh, 2000, a peak at the NASDAQ around 5178. And, um, you know, luckily I was at a friend's uh, Eagle Scout meeting and I met a broker. I'll never forget his name was Norman Epstein from a firm called uh, (laughs) all these firms. Most people won't remember Hertzfeld and Stern. And uh, I had said to him, you know, I don't uh, uh, I I actually own 10 shares of John Deere uh, back when their motto was nothing runs like a deer. Uh, unfortunately, five of my shares were stopped out because Deer decided to run to the downside. And I remember getting stopped out of five shares of my 10 at 46 and 3 eighths. And at the time, of course, you didn't have decimalization. You didn't have a May Day where commissions were um, uh, unregulated. And today, actually, uh, I'll tell you as an aside about the um, old uh, Commission subs I saw today where to buy 300 shares of a $27 stock with a discount was $127. But uh, be that as it may, I said to Norman, how could John Deere, how could I be stopped out if a stock, if the stock company comes out with record earnings? He says, well, you have to understand they weren't the record that people thought. And I said, what's the difference? A record's a record. He goes, not on Wall Street. You would have been better off if they announced a loss, but less of a loss than Wall Street thinks, that would have been bullish. And I had no idea what he was talking about, you know, as he made these general statements. And he said, you know what, besides that, your stocks have double tops who are in a bear market. So most anything you buy is going to go down. Come to my office. And at the end of that visit, he said, you could either take home all these annual reports um, stacked up against the wall. uh, And I feared imminent hernia surgery the next week if I tried to 
take those and reports home. Uh, or he said you could opt for a chart book uh, containing the charts in this trend line chart book of several hundred stocks, barely a half an inch thick. And that was my introduction into technical analysis in April of 1974. I liquidated uh, my stocks at, uh, at losses. And um, if you don't know how to take losses, this is a business you should seriously consider whether you want to be in in the first place, because success has to do with uh, taking losses more than hold it on, does. Hold on, let me stop you right there. Tell me, I tell the folks anyway, because you've told, uh, we've talked about this obviously, why don't you tell the folks how in your spreadsheets, when you keep your own P&L, what you do with your losses versus what you do with your gains? Yes, my losses are in bold red um, You know that stick out for me to see like as pronounced as you could be. And when I have a gain uh, and I write and it's a gain, it's in very thin uh, black. Um, I really don't play options, but you know, but in the rare times, I, I do very rare times because for me, I can't tell a market where it has to be at a certain period of time on a certain date. I, I can't give the market orders because it laughs at me because it knows I'm only a grain of sand on the beach. Um, even though I've been, you know, this is my 40, 30 year in the business and uh, literally my 50, um, um, third year investing. So, um, I always accentuate, um, the negative and downplay the positive cause uh, you really, you're only going to learn from your mistakes, but it's these mistakes uh, that uh, as well as in life, which is what my book's about, relationship investing, stock market therapy for your money, if I could just mention that. Um, it's really about uh, learning from your mistakes. Uh, you can't allow a cut to become a hemorrhage or a financial hemorrhage to become an amputation because you could be right nine out of 10 times and lose a significant amount of money if you don't know how to stop a loss from snowballing and once the market gets you down you know 25 percent you need 33 percent to break even heaven forbid you're down 50 percent you need a hundred percent gain to break even see that's how the market gets you and why bear markets don't have to last nearly as long as bull markets to inflict massive damage listen you're, you're telling me so hold on let's let's rewind a little bit so let's go back to to the year, the great year, 1974. Young, young, ambitious Jeffrey Weiss hits Wall Street, figures out what the technical analysis thing is all Why about. Why are you doing my biography? Hold on a second. So what are you doing with these charts? So you got this chart book. First of all, who's providing these charts? Like who's wh how, where did you where did these charts come from? They don't just fall from the sky. The trend line book I could get delivered to my home, but other than that, I use these that big mean, the trend line book? graph that? paper, and What's I drew the the, I drew a lot of the charts myself. So hold on, so you would you would get graph paper, and then you would go and 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 look at the chart, uh, look at the pricing on whatever wherever pricing thing you had, and you'd go and you draw your own damn charts. I would draw, yeah, I would draw my own charts of the indices and 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 uh, and stocks. And I actually had a little market letter when I registered with the SEC. I I had actually seen that some kid, um, uh, 15, 16 year old kid, on the front of the Wall Street Journal in the right hand column. I was reading one day that he registered as an investment advisor. So I said, I'll do the same thing. And I put out a piece to 17 people at three dollars. Uh, called the stock market specialist, which I would deliver on my bicycle, which my mom of blessed memory would um, uh, be up typing after midnight. And I'd have these trend line charts, which I'd paste and copy off on a on a copy machine. And then I had an options corner. And um, uh, actually, um, you know, I love the market so much that after I memorized the state capitals, I memorized all the stock symbols on the American Stock Exchange because <laughs> You know, one of the things, one of the things I was never a particularly gr uh, good student, but, uh, you know, in the market, you have to be a student of the market. So um, all the advanced degrees uh, that uh, uh, your kid has, sorry, moms and dads, uh, don't necessarily prepare you for um, uh, a successful investment career in the in the arena of financial gladiators, the stock market. So, um, you know, I learned the hard way, but the idea is to learn big lessons with small amounts of money 
And um, yeah, I've always been pretty hard on myself in the market. Now, if I sell something and it goes, you know, opposite, uh, or I buy something that goes down, I allow myself to pout for the day. And then the next day is all forgotten. That's that's how I approach the market. You know, the market's always trying to separate you from your money day in and day out. It just needs to get you that one time and cause you to have a few big losers during a down market to erase multiple gainers. It's just waiting for that moment. And as I say in my book, the stock market is a separation specialist. Let's talk about the 80s. Tell me about the 80s. What, what was that bull market like? Did people believe like breaking out to all time highs after like almost 20 years of no progress breaking out? Did, like were people just like, no way, this is a bubble. Like were they acting like that? Tell me what 1987 yeah, was they like. Were. Like, was a baby. You know, they were. Going. They were, and I also congratulate you on 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 um, uh, on, on the nice work I've seen you do, um, and uh, all your success with all, all star charts. Really, uh, as we say, a hearty mazel tov to uh, uh, to you, and um, may your um, success and God willing good health continue, my friend. Uh, but in the '80s, yeah, you know, people were so used to it going sideways that once it quote unquote, broke out in 82. I believe that it wasn't, let me see now, I'm going, now you have to forgive me, we're going back 38, uh, 38 and change years. It broke out early August of 82. Okay, it broke out of that phase from 66 to 82. Now it wasn't until the following spring, if memory serves me correctly, that the BL, BE Bureau of Labor Statistics, I believe the BLS, said that the recession officially ended, you know, way back when. And, you know, that's the market. The reasons for why a market is moving are rarely apparent at the time they're doing so. So I would say it was met with disbelief. And at the time, people were very interested in the uh, 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 the money supply, the money supply would come out. And that was the key uh, investment um, um, focus of, of the time. And there were two people, a Dr. Death and a Dr. Doom, Albert Wajnalauer and Henry Kaufman. Uh, I might add that I was with my son, Josh, um, gosh, uh, maybe two years ago, th three years ago at a Dunkin' Donuts locally. I don't, I don't eat that anymore. But um, and I and who was in front of me? It was Henry Kaufman, who lived, you know, who um, at the time lived near me. And I said, Josh, I want you to introduce you to a, a Wall Street genius, a legend, Dr. Death. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you see this fantastic guy, lovely man, or was it Dr. Doom? I don't remember. Um, Henry Kaufman. It was very, very funny. The sweetest person you'd ever want to meet. He was a member of my synagogue. <laughs> Great guy. That's hilarious. Yeah, but most people did not believe it. And um, um, I, you know, just like, um, you know, who would have said at the time in March, that we were going to be at you know new all time highs with um, you know what what's happened since uh, uh, since March and of course as it starts going up people say I'll wait for the retest I'll wait for the pullback I'll wait for the retest I'll wait for the pullback look where it was see people concentrate on where things were not where they're going they 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 look back you can't always look back because if you look back and you say I should have done this in my marriage it's you know it's my fault it failed that's not going to get your marriage back don't do it again. Proceed ahead and try to make it better the next time. Now, much easier said than done, but the rules I follow for the market are the rules I preach to kids for their life when I'm speaking to school and that I try to follow. Although if my wife was on, uh, she may take exception to some of that. Tell me about 87. Tell me about that crash. What was uh, that like? I was going on CNN the day after the crash, and I remember them telling me, Jeff, follow the yellow wire to our truck because each truck had a different wire
going to the um, area where the reporters were reporting on the crash. What happened in 87 is that the market gave back in less than 2% of the time, approximately 50% of a gain that it took 663 weeks approximately to achieve. So from the 1974 bottom at approximately 577, to the to the 1987 August 25th intraday high, I believe it was. And again, I didn't know you were going to ask me these questions, so I'm <laughs> I'm talking to the best of my memory. Uh, at 2722, uh, the Dow went up for approximately 660 some odd weeks. In less than eight weeks, it gave back almost 50 percent of that, going from roughly 2722 to a low on October 19th of 1616. And on, on the, on the Friday before, I think we were down a hundred and a quarter. And we, we, I remember my boss, the legend Newton Zinder saying we're rallying. We're like under two, you know, we're on, down under a hundred points. I, I remember that, but at the time, you know, we'd say, gosh, you know, week Fridays, you know, can lead to week Mondays. And Newton Zinder was a legend. He took over for Joe Granville at E.F. Hutton, gave me my break in the business. Still alive today, living in the Midwest. God bless him. Newton used to say that on Wall Street, to know what everyone else knows is to know nothing. Why don't you tell me a little bit about E.F. Hutton and Shearson Lehman and Lehman Brothers and what the differences are? I get confused myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. Why don't we walk through... Walk us through what all that means. Who are all these people in Hutton and Shearson and Lehman and why were they different companies and then one or talk about that? Well, you know, I, I got to tell you, I'm so excited to do this. And at the same time, I'm feeling like father time, like <laughs> I'm, 60, I'm 64 going on the next Fibonacci number from 55, you know, 89. Um, you know, but between that and, and, and getting, you know, um, you know, 50 calls uh, a week from, uh, Medicare enrollment from across the country, um, uh, I'm pretty tuckered out every day. Uh, although I, I haven't worked this hard since I, I grew up in the business, you know, in terms of looking at charts and sitting at home, you know, from sun up to sundown, looking at everything and, and a pretty, a pretty good sized day on Sunday. Uh, I, and this this may help some of the folks out there if you have kids looking for a job. My dad was in the trucking business. My mom was a secretary. I was the first one that went to college, uh, as you know, folks of my generation were. And uh, my dad never leaned on me to go into the trucking business or take over his company. Actually, seeing going to a truckers meeting was something that that that. Uh, that was a very scary experience for me. And uh, just, just seeing these guys smoking cigars, talking about freight, I said, I don't want to do this. So my father would take me to the Shearson Hamill office um, all the time after work and around the time we had a sixth grade uh, math project. So um, he never leaned on me to do what I wanted to do and I wanted to be in the market. So I began sending out letters and, and doing things. And um, I, I called, you know, hundreds of odd people, nothing. I called them again. Uh, as I kept calling the same list and the same list, I came upon a call late in the day one day and I hear the phone pick up and the phone, you know, the person says, Zinder. And I said, Mr. Zinder, is this Newton Zinder? He goes, Zinder, who is this? He was very to the point, Newton. And I said, I, 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 I said, it's Jeff Weiss. I, I sent you my, my uh, I'm looking for a job and I want to send you my resume. My dream is to be a technical analyst. And I'm, I'm 27 years old and I've wanted to do this since I was 13. And I've lived at home since I graduated Rutgers at 22. And this is my dream of dreams. He goes, how do you know we have a job open? Did someone tell you? I said, no. Turns out they let someone go that morning. So I interviewed, got the job, and so began, and it was the luckiest thing. I, the more no's you get, the more you have to say, listen, um, I'm going to try harder. It's, it's not my fault. Um, and you know, you, you know, you should have hired me. It's you. So that's kind of what, um, gave me the impetus to go on and on and on and on and on and on. So, uh, I began working at EF Hutton and at the time we had Mansfield charts and we went through the Mansfield charts. I went through 2000 or well, maybe at the time, yeah, maybe 1800, 1500 charts uh, once a week. 
uh, thumb through them by hand. Now I go through the Mansfield charts. I go through all of them um, every weekend, New York, American, uh, NASDAQ, and now they're on computer. Um, because they were purchased by someone. So I still go through the Mansfield charts, uh, three years, um, weekly bar chart. Um, and I won't get off the subject. But anyway, so I started EF Hutton. It was one of the greatest cultures. Uh, of course, they uh, check, uh, the check writing, or as they say, check hiding scandal kind of brought them down. And I believe that that originated in my hometown, which is right near you, uh, JC, of uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And um, I started answering calls from the from the retail system. And at the time, we had a hoot and holler. So I would get on uh, once a day and go on air. And uh, Newton would go on uh, in the afternoon. And we also had Phil Roth and uh, John Dodd. And I, I got one of those. Holler? Like this is like on a squawk box, like on an actual. Yeah, each box. office had a squawk box in the manager. What does that mean? Office. Tell the kids what that means, squawk box. Like it's, it was literally a box. Right. It's now, you know, Joe Kernan on Squawk Box, although I know Joe because we both worked at EF Hunt together and he was a rookie <laughs> there in the early 80s. So he's had a phenomenal career. Um, bless him. Uh, yeah, the hoot and holler was a way for you to hear from the syndicate department, the economist, the morning meeting, uh, the technical department, uh, fundamental research, all on this little, maybe, you know, um, three inch by five inch uh, box uh, connected to, uh, I guess like you plug in a jack to your phone and it would go national. So as I began to do it, uh, I decided to be a little more flavorful than the other folks. There was a young lady who uh, from uh, um, executive at Hutton, who said, uh, you know, we can't have him on here telling these stories and getting all our, our retail system riled up. We have to put a stop to this. So uh, my dear, dear friend, who's still a dear, dear friend at the time, and his friend uh, who ran, you know, the biggest region of the firm uh, said, uh, yeah, we're gonna try this another week and see how it goes. And luckily uh, the brokers, you know, who we referred to them as brokers, not financials at the time, took to it. Because I realized, you know, when you're a technical analyst, you could have a, a, a devoted following um, among a thin sliver. But I said, if I'm going to last in this business, I need to get as broad a following, fundamental folks, everyone out there, including technical, tell stories, relate the market to love, dating, marriage, divorce, parenting and business, make people laugh, motivate them and package it in a risk management wrapper, which is exactly which is exactly what I did. And luckily it took off. And before I knew it, I was doing two calls a day and running around the United States, giving talks to at client seminars and broker meetings and then being invited to speak in, in before an institutional audience. Um, and, um, it, you know, it was great. And basically my, my whole career is, is, or stories that are contained in the book. E.F. Hutton had a great culture. Uh, so I remember a broker telling me he had won so many trips. He had won 13 trips one year that if he went on all the trips, he'd never be able to produce enough to go on any more trips the following year. It was a great culture. We had um, the commercial when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, where people might be at an opera house and uh, a person would say, well, that's what my broker says. What does your broker say? And the person would say, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and everything would stop and everyone would lean in like hundreds of people and say, and then the commentator would say, when E.F. Hutton talks, you know, everyone, you know, listens. And um, E.F. E. Hutton was just great. The trouble was a lot of people had accounts at E.F. Hutton also had accounts at other firms. And, uh, you know, you know they, they couldn't seem to get everything under one roof, uh, is a story that was related to me when I was there. Uh, then of course, um, um, I, uh, you know, through the mergers, it was uh, uh, Hutton and then Shearson Lehman and Shearson Lehman Hutton. But a number of Hutton brokers left because of, you know, I think cultural um, issues and they wound up at Payne Weber. So I had a hunch I was going to be asked to go to Payne Weber because some of the senior people at Hutton went over there and Payne Weber had a nice 6,500 strong uh, retail sales force. And it had a really, really 
fine name. And I was asked to go to Payne Weber where I went. I, I was also at Lehman, which was fine. We had six retail branches. My history is not, not great here. Did Lehman like spin off of VF Hutton? Like wh- how did that well, work? It was Hutton and then it was, let me see how this went. I actually have it on my, my bio and I'm, I'm looking for my bio. It goes back forever, right? Was is it just Shearson, Lehman, Hutton? Is that just a coincidence in name? Yeah, I actually am going to get it right here because I have it on a sheet that, I, yeah, I actually, um, it was started, it, it, it started at EF Hutton. Then it went to Shearson, Lehman Hutton and Lehman Brothers. Um, and basically Lehman Brothers said 600 retail folks. Um, Hutton had about 6,500 brokers and e- there was a bid for EF Hunt and it's something like I think it was it Shearson want $52 a share and eventually they bid $29 a share and there were lawsuits and things like that but it really all started at EF, is EF Hunt now Shearson Hamill eventually if memory serves me correctly went through so many mergers that today it's Citigroup Right, because they were the supermarket and they bought all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that that makes a lot I of sense. I believe Sandy Weil was the chairman there. Yeah, I'm trying to go back into the '60s and '70s, you know, a half a half century ago, and figure this. But the E. F. Hutton culture, I, I still speak to a lot of people at Hutton, and they're still in the business, and their kids are in the business, and they just don't think it'll ever be duplicated. The camaraderie. Uh, the 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 closeness, the the helping hand one to the other. It's just a shame they had to go through that uh, that check writing or kiting or whatever people want to call it issue because uh, they had some really marvelous um, uh, people, and it's just a shame that um, got, you know it couldn't continue for uh, uh, forever. All right. So, okay. So here we are, here we are. It's nineties now. So now Jeff's got a couple of decades of experience. So now you're the man you've worked at uh, EF Hutton, Lehman brothers. You've been at Payne Weber for years. Now we're entering the second half of the nineties, big time bubble. What was that like your experience now, right? You're not a young buck anymore. So what was, what was that like now that you've seen a couple of cycles? Well, you know, it's funny. I always say, no matter what you've seen, um, it, 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 it's somewhat helpful, but you can live to, you know, Methuselah, you know, in the Bible, live to 969, you can live longer than Methuselah and still um, uh, not be ready to have what the market um, uh, throws uh, at you. Um, You know, I I remember calling, was it the 90s? Yeah, and up until, yeah, the the 90s from, well, the Gulf War, you know, happened and the, the Dow went from basically 3,000 to around 2,300 and change. Uh, when they tried, uh, when uh, Iraq's foreign minister, Tarak Aziz, uh, was speaking to the uh, Bush administration, they were hoping for some sort of resolution and they didn't have it. The market tumbled and tumbled and tumbled toward a low from uh, which it uh, recovered uh, nicely. Um, I remember, um, I'm just trying to think, was it the 90s where I referred to it as the, um, let me just take a look for for one second. I'm just going to take a look one second if it was this decade that I referred to when I was on the call. I referred to at least, well, at least, well, that was the time when you, the middle of decades was the strongest. I think we had 10 in a row between 1885 and 1895, JC, yeah. where if you look at the Stock Traders Almanac and, and uh, um, Yale, Yale and Jeff's uh, great work and fantastic people, by the way, I've known Je- uh, Jeff for, for, for a, you know, a, a decent while, uh, you know, that 95 onto the top in 2000 and even the early, you know, to mid nineties were, 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 were decent. We, we did go sideways in 94. I referred to as the, you know, buzz light year market uh, on my call, but I, you know, to infinity and beyond, but I always added with stops because you have to assume you're wrong every time you speak 
and very few people speak more than me. So I have to realize that every time you do something or every time you speak, you could be wrong. And the one time uh, you say, well, I don't need to stop. I don't have to worry about the downside. That's the market. Uh, that, that's where the market uh, may hurt you. The market works its way to your weakest investment link. Just like when you have a health issue, that's your weak link. And if you stress yourself, often you'll see it manifest in your weakest link. And again, I'm no medical professional, far from it, but I could tell you that uh, nothing is worth your health. So sometimes you have to sell down to the sleeping point, the point at which you can make a less emotional decision and not let the market uh, infiltrate your life. I actually have five YouTube videos on my site that um, go through uh, some of the things one should look at. But the 90s were great. Of course, uh, uh, you know, the 2000 to 2002 period was was uh, pretty much disastrous before the October bottom, uh, which which watched the NASDAQ go from 5178 to under 1200. And then, of course, the uh, S&P and uh, you know, O2 coming down, um, um, you know, back, uh, um, you know, under 800 before uh, going up to 1500 and change before collapsing again in, in um, um, to, through the 2009 uh, bottom. So, you know, I lived through all these things, also two flash crashes, and um, it's, uh, it, it does wear on you. I, I will tell you, I, I try to have a good diet. If I, I'm, I'm going to write, an, I should write another book, Dieting for Market Participants, because uh, you really have to keep yourself in mental shape. And I have a chapter called Financial Freud in the book, which contains questions that investors may want to ask themselves before they invest. <laughs> it's all... <laughs> Well, I, I always, it's funny that you said that because I always say you got to, you got to, you got to figure out like what your objectives are, what your risk tolerance is, what sort of time horizon you have. Like these have to be nailed down before you even enter the trade, not afterwards, right? You, like everybody knows like that trade that turns into an investment, like it goes from, uh, you know, a MACD crossover to next thing you know, you're listening to conference calls, right? Like the, 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 the it's, you want to avoid all that. So Kudos to you for yes, bringing it up. You do. As a technician, I, 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 and I just say this because I used to use placemats. I used to use annual reports for placemat settings, so I didn't have to get the placemats dirty. Because I don't want to see a company spend millions of dollars on an annual report telling me what was. Show me next year's annual report, and I'll read the color pages. Um, but you're, you know, you're, you're. That that's really the key. You have to prepare ahead of time. See, when I prepare. Before I, I would invest money, I'd say, how much can I lose on the trade? I never consider the upside because the upside's not going to hurt me. Just like when you enter into a relationship, you want to say, what's the worst that can happen? And, uh, you know, in my case, I married perfection and my wife married right. total imperfection. So, um, you know, um, how happy I am. I put that ad in uh, a magazine back in the late 1980s. And um, how unhappy my wife is, she responded, I'm truly the happiest person. And this was, well, tonight's first night of Hanukkah, you know, miracle. So, um, you know, and uh, that, you know, my life was a miracle, um, you know, meeting her. So um, you want to make sure you're pretty well grounded at, at home, that uh, you're getting enough sleep, that you're um, uh, stepping back and taking an aerial view and not having your nose so close to the quote machine that you're seeing um, things that aren't there and that you're hallucinating and imagining things. Take a look. Look at the big picture. Like Charles Dow referred to the market, the three trends, the ripples, the short term, the waves, the intermediate or medium term, and of course, the tide, the long term. And you can't swim against the tide. Of course, if you're a great swimmer and you go against the tide, you'll last longer than a novice swimmer. But this tide is still going to claim you, which means in the market speak, no matter what kind of expert you are, if you're putting most of your money to work in a primary bear market, 
you're going to lose money. It doesn't really matter what you buy in the vast amount of cases. And you've got to be able, in my opinion, to spend enough time identifying the market's primary trend because that's the trend within which all others exist. Just like in a relationship, if you're basically dating or married to a wonderful person, and you know that the downside is minimal and that they're wonderful people, generous, kind, considerate, you, you're, you know your downside is going to be more, more limited. You know, I always say, to say and I, I talk about this, when, when, when you're buying more of a stock or, into, or buying more of a market in, into uh, negativity in terms of the trend, intermediate term, trend line breaks, downside gaps, negative outside days and weeks, things that I look at. Um, that's like being in a relationship and saying, you know, it's strained. We're not really communicating well or getting along. Um, it just seems that things aren't as they were. So, hey, Let's get engaged, buy a ring, get married, have children, buy a house, and continue this dysfunction for generations to come. Now, you're not going to say that in your life, God forbid, but in the stock market, egos and money do funny things to people and cause them to act in a way they would not act if it was real life. And that's why I wanted to put the book out to help people maybe ground their stock market philosophy in a philosophy that they use in their everyday lives as parents, as cousins, as siblings, as citizens. And that's basically the way I look at the market. It's, 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 it's really nothing more than life. And of course, technical analysis takes into consideration zillions of people with zillions of dollars, with zillions of different personalities, um, ranging from conservative to, you know, OCD, AD, to every diagnosis in the book. And that's all reflected in the movement of money. It's supply and demand. For me, why do I want to be looking at the company and putting a middleman or person or middle woman in between me and the market? It's like, it's like saying, hey, I want to, I want to date this, this person. You know what I'll do? I won't, I won't date him or her. I will ask their siblings, or their parents or their friends. You don't want to do that. You want to go out with the source of your interest, that person. So that's why I say to people, why, why I'll be with my friends say, why are you looking at the company? You're not investing in the company, you're investing in the stock. So look at the stock. If you think good companies become good stocks, well, then everyone is going to make money all the time. But that's not quite how the way the market works. Oh my God, that's hilarious! By the way, great advice on just the lifestyle and all of that stuff. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with with that. I was gonna. One of the things I was gonna ask you was like, Oh my God, how do you last in this business for so long? You're 50, pushing fifty years. I mean, it's crazy. But hold on, I want to before I, I want to rewind. You were calling. You were talking about the quote machine, right? So like, we have some a lot of people listening. Some people have been in the business as long as you, and there's some people that are new, and there are people around the world that just can't you know, sort of comprehend the types of things that you're talking about, like these old, some of the old school stuff that you're mentioning, like the squawk box. Tell me about the quote machine. Cause that's like, you literally refer to it like it's almost like it still exists. Like what is a quote machine? Well, the quote machine, and it was beautiful cause I got to sit with all these, these people who lived through the great depression in the late twenties and early thirties when the Dow went from 388 to 32 before bottoming on July 8th in 1932. And they would tell me stories about breadlines and what they went through as children. And now they're in their late seventies and their eighties. 
and um, I would uh, basically pedal my bike that I got from my profits in Mattel, which is kind of like owning a Tesla today, you know, having a three-speed bicycle back. <laughs> I say in my I say in my book, um, and um, we would go in and we would be on a long line at the Shearson Hamill office, and the news would be coming up very slowly in green lettering on the black background, and I was just fascinated with it. And um, I couldn't, I just loved the color scheme. And uh, you could see the grimaces or the euphoria on people's faces as they waited for the quote machine to produce uh, results. Uh, you know, at the time, my father owned Eastern Airlines and, oh gosh, we, he drove a, a he drove a Pontiac um, um Catalina um we'd go up there we'd um, have a two dollar and 95 cent uh, burger special at the forum diner and go across the street and he'd hit quotes and it was basically a a three or four inch square um quote machine with a little top coming out to um you know to prevent the glare from um reflecting off the glass and uh, people would look and they would be you know they would do four or five because heaven forbid you took up the quote machine when there's a big line of people waiting to get on there and of course if you wanted to put in an order you had to go to your broker and they would actually send it through these tubes like you would send through your bank now and they would write it down and the operator would get it and send something you know, out and, and on the floor of the stock exchange, there were these enunciator boards, uh, they were called, and you would have each um, um, member firm or would have their employees, they would have a number and they would go to the post and they would execute the, uh, they would execute the trade for you. Uh, when I went over to Edwards and Hanley, and I was hitting my quotes on the uh, same type of machine, uh, I remember my first thousand share trade was Annixter Brothers, A-N-X. Oh my gosh, why did I say I look back? Ugh, I'm going to be sick. Uh, a thousand shares at seven and a quarter. And as I watch the, the tape at the time must have been 75 feet long on the New York and the bottom was the American Stock Exchange. So, I mean, I we watched Resorts International go from like two to 200. We watched Teleprompter and Buttes Gas and Oil. And we watched, I mean, we watched stocks go crazy. I mean, we watched like Metro Media went from like, what was it, 10 to 500 or whatever. And some of these things were crazy. And um, I also watched the top tick in American Motors, I believe it was 13 and 3 ace during the height of the gas crisis in 73, 74. Uh, you know, the Gremlin, the Rambler, the Matador, the Ambassador, uh, the Hornet. Uh, and I watched it, you know, go from 13 and 3 ace to basically nothing. Um, and uh, my first trade in Annexter is I saw it come by the thousand shares because every order came by in those days. I remember standing up and screaming with all these old people there. I must have scared them half to death. Said, that's my order. Alex, that's my stock. That's my stock. That's my stock. That's my. And, and that was the enthusiasm I had at the time in the market. And I think it's the enthusiasm, I, a, a lot of which I, I still have today, although it's different when you're 64 acting like that and when you're, um, and when you're um, you know, uh, 19. So that was really the quote machine. And then we graduated on to a, from the Bunker Amo to the Quotron, where you could get about 60 or 70 um, uh, names on the watch list. And I was at the Merrill Lynch office. And in the Merrill Lynch office, um, I had one, one quick story. I'm sitting in the Merrill Lynch office and everyone's using Merrill Lynch research. And it was, it was 50 brokers there, it was 40, 50 rows. It was gigantic. And I watched people walking out of the Merrill office and going into the elevator from the second to the third floor. And I said, I wonder what's going on. So one day I followed a few of the fellas into the elevator, up to the third floor, into a barren office with a bunch of, you know, for, um, uh, men with, um, you know, ties that, um, you know, um, are, are about uh, two feet above their waist and their shirt collars open um, and they're entering orders for $25 an order at a firm called Dick Blackman. Wouldn't you know it, Merrill Lynch moved their office up Route 17 in Paramus, New Jersey. Dick Blackman 
Um, and I, he wrote a book called Follow the Leaders. I believe it was a technical analyst too. Uh, Dick started a, a brokerage firm, $25 a trade, and mighty Merrill Lynch, the mighty Merrill Lynch office actually moved their location. I believe it was because Dick Blackman was, was right above them. And it was the beginning, of course, of when commissions were became unregulated back in the 1970s in May. 75, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And wasn't that around the first, don't, right? Weren't options trading, didn't it start right around there, 74, something like that? What was the first trading yes. days of options like? Yes, yes, 10 options before, it, and, and, and um, we're, we're mentioning this. They had a company called Ragnar, R-A-G-N-A-R, -A -A puts and calls, and they'd say, for instance, for and everything I say just for illustrative purposes only, my friend, you're going to have to talk to your own financial advisor or accountant or financial professional. I'm just telling you, you know, some stories from, from Jeff Weiss, but I always tell people, you know, I'm not you. Uh, you're going to have your own beliefs and your feelings. It's just mine have been ingrained from investment birth. So that's why I, uh, you may think that I say them forcefully, but, uh, but for me, for Jeff Weiss, I believe in them morning, noon, and night, and I will never fear from them for the rest of my life, um, afterlife, afterlives, or pre-life. Um, so Ragnar puts in calls. Let's say General Mills, You they may say, well, you could have a call option at 50 for $375.90 for the next uh, six months. Realizing that you know you would add the three dollars and whatever to the fifty strike, and you'd pay you know three hundred and whatever dollars, and then you would uh, uh, see if it was in the money or out of the money. But that became obsolete because they put out these puts and calls on IBM. I think it was digital equipment, maybe. I know it was IBM was one and some other stocks. I'm sitting in the Merrill office, and and this guy named Walter who was a chain smoker um, at Merrill uh, called me over and say today i he says in his heavy hungarian a russian accent he says today i teach you about in the money and out of the money i said <laughs> okay okay and he and, and i learned what in the money and out of the money were and that was right right around right there i think it was in that area oh, ugh, 73 to 75 i'm guessing thousands of options at the time we had 10 i mean i mean this is like this is like having a kid be at a little league game and then all of a sudden the next afternoon playing in the world series i mean this is unbelievable <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> so but how fast did it go from just like a few options contracts to like real liquidity like when did it really start getting going well, to the best of my knowledge, and these are tough questions, which you said to be prepared for. <laughs> Although I've had to take questions from my wife, so I'm ready for you. Um, let's see. Um, I remember they expanded pretty well, but they were still puts and calls. I don't know the first ETFs, but there went to hundreds of them and it didn't take that long. And you did not see again, Ragnar puts and calls and these other put and call houses because, you know, they became, tra they were traded on the exchanges. And I guess it, it just hasn't stopped in the nearly um, 45 years since. Yeah, it's been it's been wild to see. That's why I, I tell people go back and read about the Great Depression, what happened, you know, go back and look at 87 and, and see things. I mean, it's not just as people say, well, if I would have held it would have come back. I said, hey, it's very easy to say that. But when you're in the middle of it and you know your kid needs to go to college in six months, you know, it, uh, you know, just because you buy you know, just, this is a good story, just because you know, uh, your kid's going to college in, uh, you know, uh, seven, eight years doesn't mean that the market's going to accommodate you and go up a certain amount of money. Right. I mean, what if right. your kid had to go to college in 2009 after the S&P got nearly cut in half or after the NASDAQ fell 78 percent? You know, I always tell people you know, the reason I bought some zeros when my kids were born at the time, they were yielding 8 percent. And I tried to turbocharge their portfolios with uh, stocks. I said the key for me doing that was to protect my children from my own genius.
what, what about when you were what about when you were young, Jeff? When you were young and you were first getting in the business, you were talking with people who experienced the Great Depression, right? Any any good lessons you remember from what the old timers told you when you were just a young guy that, you know, a hundred years later, people don't even you know, people don't even understand what happened back then. And that's true. It's been from twenty nine to nineteen. Yeah, it's been this will be ninety one um what, nine to one years next year. Yeah. Next year. Um, you know, it reinforced in me really what I saw in 73, 74, that you could make money hand over fist for a few decades. And in one vicious bear market that you ride through, you could lose, you know, half of that money. Or in the Great Depression, you know, people lost fortunes and, you know, not to mention maybe, you know, not being able to, uh, you know, um, buy all the, all the uh, bread they needed. I mean, uh, I have the book. I haven't read it all. I've read some of it. Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay. It's a 600 some odd page book. Um, see, I don't read a lot of books on finance in the market. All of that was my my degree. I just needed my degree to get a job from Rutgers. So, you know, my dad spent 900 bucks a year for me to go to Rutgers, Newark. And I said, I know what I want to do because, you know, I'm looking at charts. My education is in the stock market, but I knew obviously I needed a college education to get a, um, to get a job. So, but in terms of uh, the great depression, the good thing is I learned the downside first. Uh, and I also had experienced the downside in 73, 74. So I had a lot of downside training at a very young age. And, it, you know, some may think it was it was a little bit depressing for a youngster to go through that and a teenager to go through that. But it's also the reason I have eight uh, HEPA filters in my house filtering the air and why I'm on my eighth Volvo, because nothing crashes like a Volvo, which uh, unfortunately my family can attest to on several occasions. Uh, everything to me is risk management, not the mar just in the market. It's what I eat. It's the air in my home. It's it's the it's. I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. I'm 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 a bit I'm a bit out there. I could be <laughs> the only person in my town that actually purchased earthquake insurance in Bergen County, New Jersey. <laughs> but I will tell you this, about seven, eight years ago, there was a tremor and my son called me and said, Dad, all my cassettes fell off my desk. And I found out it was a slight tremor. And I was going to say, and, 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 you know, I didn't want to get excited and say, see, I, I had earthquake insurance because I didn't want to be happy about it. But again, you know what, for the ex, you know, for a hundred bucks a year, anything that helps you sleep at night for the least amount of money <laughs> is worth it. So everything to me is risk management. I think I'm a basically you know happy person. My wife is constantly happy, which in itself is somewhat depressing. But um, she's also a French trained chef, so I better behave myself if I want a nice dinner on the first night of Hanukkah. I, listen, I uh, as a as a as a French wine scholar and certified sommelier, I oh, uh, you're I, you're, I, you're beyond most. I mean, what you've accomplished in your oh my gosh! If I was your age, I could only imagine what the horizon holds. No, uh, soon I'm gonna get. We'll we'll all have dinner together. I'll bring my wife. I'll bring the wine. Your wife can cook. Um, you know. <laughs> You know, you're always welcome, my son. I'm wearing, you know, to remind myself um, of uh, and remind my kids of uh, what all of us parents spend on their college. I'm wearing my Muhlenberg uh, um, um, pullover and I was wearing my uh, Endicott college um, uh, hat. So, uh, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, what college costs then and what college costs now. But I think in, in, in leaving, I think, you know, just for your for your audience, um, it always pays to look at the downside. Don't take for granted what you see in front of you. You know, your your family, uh, your friends is is you, you get ready and you're celebrating Christmas and Hanukkah and going through. I know tough times with the COVID, of course, being in Bergen County, New Jersey. Un unfortunately, we've experienced a lot of that firsthand. And I could only wish you uh, all uh, blessings to you and, and, and your family, uh, the brightness and, and the 
light of your holidays that it illuminates on your your health and your happiness and hopefully uh, at some point you'll do something and uh, I could speak because I love meeting people in person not being able to travel and and get on college campuses and go before audiences uh, is uh, been especially difficult but thank God I'm able to talk to you about it in uh, in good health now thank God definitely where can people reach you Jeff tell the folks where to find you well, you know, the, the website is weissspeaks.com, uh, uh, three S's in the middle. Uh, you know, the and I found that, and again, no, I'm not telling you anything because no one gets wealthy <laughs> writing books. But, you know, we, we did luckily sell out the first printing of the book in hardcover. And I just found out that Relationship Investing Stock Market Therapy for Your Money, which the Stock Traders Almanac, um, I thank them for this, um, gave it the 2018's Best Investment Book of the Year uh, naming. Uh, it'll be out in uh, around April in soft cover. I just found that out um, and I was flattered they're, they're bringing it out. So um, um, I think that contains a lot of what I, what I spoke about. Uh, let me also say that for me, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefevre, L-E-F-E-V-R-E, -E -E, written in 1923, is, I don't think you could find a better book than that, which is um, from what you'll see on the internet, a fictionalized account of the greatest trader of all time, uh, did very well during the Great Depression, but his wife at the time was so frugal that she thought they lost money. So what she did is when the floors were warped, rather than having the floors redone, she cut the legs of the table so they'd lay flat on the floor. Uh, Jesse Livermore always used to say two key things. They, these things, um, these are things I'm reminded of constantly. Number one, um, that the human side of every person is the greatest enemy of the average investor or speculator. Um, um, I'm trying to think the, uh, he said 20 other things and there's, there's several other things I like, but in the interest of time, I'll just, you know, cut it at, at, at that and uh, recommend reminiscences of a stock operator, which is still a, a pretty good seller today. And it was written um, um, in 1923, 98 years ago. I highly recommend the book as well, especially as a historian hearing, lo you know, loving to hear all these old stories, uh, you know, not to call you old, Jeff, but th these are some pretty old school stories you got. <laughs> I am. You know, I hopefully the kid in, in the kid in all of us never leaves. And that's how we can relate to our own to our own kids. I know during COVID, I've I've been humbled losing to my youngest one. Um, uh, I, we figured out about 97. It's like my temperature, 97.6% in ping pong, uh, almost that in Scrabble, uh, Boggle, basketball, and any other uh, sport or word game you could think of. Uh, reading has just propelled him to heights I could never have dreamed of. So during this uh, uh, lockdown, so to speak, I think the more reading your kids could become interested in and do, uh, the better it would be. And I also like to thank uh, you for having me on, JC. I've, I've really enjoyed this as much as any any interview I've, I've done in many, many, many um, uh, years and several decades. And your success and your, your acumen in and in technical analysis and also you know i i find myself being closer to your camp than others you know i'm not a big mac d guy i'm not a big stochastic person i look at supply demand chart patterns uh, trend lines outside days uh gaps try to get the primary trend correct not a delve deep enough to make a decision and a determination but i don't like to overanalyze because i used to have a lot more hand work i did i write down everything by hand every day i use one sheet for my daily i use one sheet for my weekly and i was showing it to a friend of mine during the 73 74 bear market and he said jeff a lot of your things seem to be showing the same exact result you don't need all these things. You could do half of what you're doing and come to the same conclusion. So that's what I did. You know, I don't, I try never to overanalyze. And Jesse Livermore used to say, <laughs> it, it did, you know, when he was going to do something, it did not, it did not require, you know, it did not require much reflection to paraphrase. Listen, Jeff, it's great advice. This was a lot of fun.
Thank you. Uh, seriously. Thank you. This is awesome. Well, I, I thank you and, and I thank your audience and I, I and just thank you for what you do for technical analysis, taking it uh, uh, countrywide, uh, worldwide. And um, I know it may be hard to believe because of all the success you have, but I know the best is yet to come. And, and, and as I always tell people and as I always tell kids when I speak to them, uh, no matter how successful you are in your life, you don't complete the circle unless you give uh, when you have. And also, as, as I, I've taught my kids, you know, being co confidence but not cockiness is a very good way uh, to live your life. And I, I, I think we have something in common in that regard. And looking at your beautiful little girl, I know it's reinforced in you. So uh, to you and Morgan and everyone and your families have um, a fantastic holiday season. And to all your listeners, I, I sincerely thank you for taking time to listen to me because you have a choice and I'm, I'm honored you, you made that choice to hear what I had to say today. Thank you for that, Jeff. I'll try to, uh, I'll try to make you proud. <laughs> you, 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 listen, boy, if I was where you were now, oh my gosh, I, I, I would try to contain yourself, JC. <laughs> You're the man, Jeff. Talk soon, Bye, buddy. everybody. Have a beautiful holiday season <laughs> to your families, and I can't see you, but hugs to you all. That's today's show. Thanks for listening. Big shout out to Jeff Weiss for sharing all these really cool stories. If you want to catch up on other podcast episodes, please visit allstarcharts.com slash podcast. 